rental services and transition services. But as Carrie discussed for the purposes of today, I'm wearing a secondary hat and I'm gonna be going over the FAST program. So I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint. Please feel free if you have questions to ask. Um, and once I'm done with my presentation, I will leave my contact information in the chat box in case anybody needs to reach me or may have any additional questions. So let me just go ahead and pull this up and we'll go ahead and get started. Perfect. So as Kerry discussed, I think all of you may be familiar with FAST, but FAST stands for the Florida Alliance for Assistive Services and Technology. Our center actually has a Southwest and a Southeast Regional Demonstration Center grant through FAST. Southwest covers the Gulf Coast area, which is not anything you guys need to be worried about. However, our Southeast coverage area is covered Palm Beach, Indian River, Martin, Okeechobee, and St. Lucie. So hopefully, like I said, what I kind of discussed today will resonate with some of you guys, be something that may be of interest and you'll be able to take advantage of it. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with FAST or may not know what it is, it's been funded through the Assistive Technology Act of 2004, and that's the Florida statute that kind of governs us. And essentially kind of summarizing FAST in a nutshell, it allows for the demonstration and the learning about what technology is available to assist someone with the activities of daily living, which can include, and it also encompasses employment. So it could be any type of activities of daily living that you may need to be able to use or demonstrate some assistive technology. You see some examples here on the screen that will help somebody in their day-to-day -day activities in their day-to-day -day living. Um, couple things that can help with mobility, sensory, cognitive issues. Um, like I said, it's to hopefully allow somebody to be as independent as possible and as fully integrated in the community as much as they can be. Who do we serve? This is one of the things that I do think is very unique about this program and service. Oftentimes when you hear from agencies and programs, it's usually just the individual with the disability that is able to access these programs and services. However, for FAST, because they do want this to be all inclusive, it also allows for family members or any type of guardian or authorized representative. And it also allows for the community at large to be able to um, get device loans and kind of learn a little bit more about the equipment and technology from education facilities, employers, healthcare providers. So if you know you're gonna have an individual disability and maybe you wanna be able to more effectively communicate and interact with them, you are able to are able to check out the equipment, sample it, and try it out and see if it may be something that will be beneficial. So how was the technology broken down? When you think of technology, it could be sometimes a little overwhelming or a little bit kind of cumbersome, maybe not knowing. So there is a website and I'm gonna show you that in a little bit, but it's broken down into different categories from vision, speech and communication, hearing, computer related, mobility, vehicle modifications, activity of daily living, environment adaptations. And like I said, you don't have to be experts in all these. You don't have to know what each of these are. Um, oftentimes myself, I'm still kind of learning on the fly myself. So it's kind of one of those things where hopefully, like I said, if you just know that there's a need out there, um, you could go to, the, to our site, which I'm gonna stop screen sharing and get that, pull that up real fast. And you can see what it looks like. Give me one second. Give me one second, my apologies. Okay, so this is the FAST website, as you see right here. Um, it's FAST.org, very easy, two A's, and that stands for, once again, Florida Alliance for Assistive Services and Technology. And once you're on this home screen, you'll see several different things, but services will be the most important one. Um, what you're going to want to go to over is to the resources, and on the resources, you'll see two things. First is a regional service center. So if you don't know what may be the closest center, you could click on this, and it will give you a listing of all the different centers and where they're located at based off counties. 
So you don't have to worry if you don't remember what county may be coverage, or maybe sometimes there might be one that's a little bit closer. And then the second thing, which will be of great assistance, is going back up to resources and looking at the lending library. The lending library looks exactly kind of like the last slide I showed you guys on my PowerPoint. It has it broken down to different categories. And if you click on any one of these, and I'm just going with daily living, you will see a variety of different things that you could check out. Um, it has it by a few pages from an Echo Dot to the Echo Shows to if you need adaptive eating utensils. And once again, the utilization of this stuff is free. Um, you're able to get it loaned out to you for up to 35 days. If you need it for longer, you can request for it longer. Um, there's a few pages worth of catalogs. So it's not just these devices that I shared. Um, it has additional things, anything you could think of from switches to assistance with bed cane to smart pens. And you could get this equipment loaned out to you so you can sample and try it before you go out and purchase it. And it may not be the appropriate fit for you or the individual you're trying to assist. So that's the good thing about this. Like I said, um, if you don't see it, it may be the first category looking. I encourage you to go back and maybe search another category. Um, some things also do have some overlap. As you see, the Echo Dot is also in adaptive equipment as well as daily living. So sometimes you'll be able to find it. Like I said, obviously, if you're not able to find it, you can contact your local regional demonstration center and we certainly can assist you. Um, you could also email it based off this website. So there's a variety of different ways you can reach out to us if you need some assistance. We don't expect everybody to be experts with this. But once again, the thing is just knowing there that it's a resource. So let me pull back up my PowerPoint. And that kind of just helps you with regards, like I said, to identifying devices that could be helping. So um, a device loan, as I was discussing, um, if you need to kind of learn how to use the equipment, we're able to do demonstrations on it. So either myself or my colleagues, we could come out and actually show you how to use the device. Um, like I said, we don't expect anybody to know readily right off the bat, but we can come out and do free demonstrations in terms of the different devices. So you can learn how to use them in your home setting. Um, you're able to ask any questions you need to ask, and we can help get you set up with that. I'm just going to read this a little bit verbatim. So the um, Fast directly or in collaboration with the public or private entities demonstrate a variety of assistive technology devices and assistive technology services. This is including individuals and in making informed choices regarding and providing experience with the device and services. Once again, like I said, it doesn't do you any good to purchase something and then you realize it may not be the right device and you're now having to return it. So this gives you a free opportunity to learn from the device, see how it could be beneficial. Um, like I said, if maybe this isn't the right one, you could then check out a different device. You're able to check out up to four at a time. There's really no limit, but we just figure four is a good number to help you get acclimated. If none of the four devices you check out work, you certainly can then check out another device. Um, like I said, checking out the devices, you can check it out up to 35 days. Um, once again, um, it allows you to fool around with it. You can play with it. We have apps as well as actual durable medical equipment type devices. So it allows individuals to check out maybe tablets that can have a variety of different software on it or laptop computers. Um, like I said, um, for activity, for regional activities. And like I said, the, the purpose or the intent of the short-term life device loans is to help you make an informed choice or decision whether or not the device is gonna be appropriate for you and be able to help you. So if you need more time with it, you certainly wanna allow for that. Oftentimes, um, one of the questions we ask is, how do you get this? Oftentimes, health insurance will sponsor it. I know we also have vocational rehabilitation online. If it's for the intention of employment, um, they have rehab engineers that they work with as well who can make a recommendation of such devices, and vocational rehab can sponsor it when it's work-related. Um, sometimes you may not fall into any of those categories, and the FAST program itself we have a program called the New Horizon Loan Program, which allows for loans to individuals and their families to be able to purchase the device. Unlike other loans, it's very flexible. Um, like I said, it's pretty easy going. It allows people who are only on social security or disability insurance to be able to get it. 
It's very low interest rates. It's expended for a longer space of time to allow for the purchasing of the device. And we could assist them as it pertains to trying to fill out the paperwork and get these devices. Um, some of the things that you could get through the loan program could be from hearing aids. Like I said, home modification, accessibility assistance, modifications for a vehicle, um, for individuals who need tele telecommunication devices or deaf or hard of hearing. One point of reference for the vehicle modification, it tends to try to be for seven vehicles that are seven year old, old or newer and have less than 80,000 miles. But all these are recommendations. Sometimes in special situations, they may be willing to look beyond that. So like I said, if somebody needs help in kind of building the case or whatever, we certainly can assist with that if it's outside the realm of these things. But like I said, there's a whole different series of ways to get some of these devices sponsored and covered for somebody who may need them for the purposes of kind of learning about assistive technology. The other thing that I didn't mention is even though we are physically in Broward County, if somebody needs to get these devices, we mail it out to them free of cost. They're certainly welcome to come to our office if they want to have a little trek down to Broward County to see our loan library. But if they want to go on the website to see it, they certainly can. And then, like I said, we mail it out free of cost to them and provide a shipping label to send it back. And that is it right now. Um, I will open up to questions. My apologies, as I too do have to go soon, but I want to at least answer any questions that somebody may have about the program, if there are any. Either I've totally confused you or there's no questions, but you, <laughs> wait, I appreciate it. Like I said, I will leave my contact information in the chat box in case maybe you think of something as well as the website for FAST. Um, if anything comes up, please feel free to let me know. Like I said, I can stay on for a little bit, but I definitely um, will be probably getting out early. So thank you once again for your time. Thanks, Brian. That was question. awesome. Oh, there's a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm in Palm Beach County. Does the silo here in Palm Beach County have that lending library? No, we would have, a, we're the ones that have the grant. But like I said, if it's some, if you needed to borrow the equipment or want to get it loaned or somebody you're working with, we can ship it to them. There's oh. no cost. Um, like I said, and it's usually a pretty quick turnaround. The only drawback from that is that they typically, meaning the state office, only ships it out on Wednesday. So if you get it in like on a Tuesday, It'll be great, but if you get it Thursday, you'll have to wait till the following week before it can get shipped out. But either other than that, like I said, we could get it. But no, unfortunately, the silo is not um, participating in this program. So we're the one that has coverage for this area. Great, so thank you. You're welcome. One more question, and I'm, I apologize. This is Barbara Flood from the ARC. I apologize if I missed this information in your presentation. Yes. Is there an age requirement for your services? No, I didn't mention it. So good question to ask. No, there are no age requirements. So it could be from baby to elderly. Um, anybody, I used to say zero to grade, but people didn't like that. So that's why I say from baby to elderly, um, anybody is eligible for this program. And like I said, the good thing is it's not only for individual disabilities. That's the thing that's so great about this program. Obviously, that's the targeted population. But like I said, if a family member or a community agency wanting to get better acclimated with some equipment, they are welcome to also get the device loan so that they could better then communicate or interact with the uh, individual with disabilities and stuff like that. So no Fantastic. age requirement. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to present. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Totally. All right, so next up, Doug Meeker, all the way from where are you again, Doug, here in Virginia? I'm, I'm outside of Washington, DC. All right, so a little chilly up there. Thanks for joining us, Doug. We're very excited to learn about Life Sherpa. Great, thanks for having me. So let me go ahead and get started here. Um, Life Sherpa is an assistive technology. We're a little different uh, in that we really focus on providing organizations uh, the ability to create their own assistive technology solutions. So we are a SaaS platform uh, built for the enterprise, uh, and we include mobile apps and web apps. We can configure to a particular organization's needs, and we're focused on working across a variety of programs, vocational employment, 
uh, retention. So think of us as, as a way to add a digital coaching solution to, to any program um, that you might be, be utilizing. And what we do is we help organizations build their own customized remote support digital coaching solution. So we help you brand it uh, to your organization. We give you a token so that your clients can go to the app store and download an app that's got your logo on it and is configured to that individual's particular program and, and whatever program they're working on with your organization. And our philosophy has been how to create uh, one app uh, that could go across multiple uh, use cases, whether someone is using it at home, whether they're using it at work, uh, whether they're using it at school, and also um, how they can weld in different support circles that they may have supporting them. So that was a lot. A uh, little background, like uh, many of us, uh, this started with my son. My background is in technology. I started way back uh, working in engineering software and then finance software and then digital media. And then my son got diagnosed with autism. And uh, I was working with a group of ABA therapists and we were looking for different ways to help him overcome his executive functioning challenges, getting ready for school, you know, brushing his teeth for more than, you know, one or two seconds, uh, all of those typical challenges. And that's, that's kind of where Life Sherpa started. We originally built it uh, to work with families and with therapists. And then we started a journey where we started interacting with human service organizations and others. And, and then it kind of morphed into something for organizations versus uh, strictly for families. And we work with a variety of organizations, employers, uh, college programs, human services uh, organizations. We're working uh, in the UK, we're working in Australia. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about today was, was what many of you are dealing with, and I thought it was interesting at the start of this, is the labor issue. Because as we have gone through our journey, um, uh, we've certainly heard that and uh, about the challenges that human service organizations are, are facing out there. And, and that kind of focused uh, our quest on how we could use technology to help many of these organizations um, be able to do more, get better visibility into what they're doing, uh, but help them address uh, some of these workforce uh, development problems. So we, we're focused on, on, on three specific areas. One, how we help organizations with their capacity, their visibility, which is a, a key issue. You know, what are the metrics and the data uh, that you've got going in your programs that will help you figure out uh, how to do more? And most importantly, and kind of where we started with Scott, um, how to drive that independence. By the way, he's been using Life Sherpa now for four years. He has not missed the bus and he now actually brushes his teeth for 30 seconds instead of two. Still irritates his sister, but uh, major progress, trust me. So what do we mean by capacity? Um, what we wanna help you there is how we can do more things on a remote basis, how we can uh, take staff time down per client in a way that helps them work with more clients, or more importantly, helps them work with more clients who really need that extra attention. Uh, in my son's case, uh, he doesn't need a lot of help, but he's in programs uh, where there are other kids that do. Uh, we want to be able to make help staff be able to do more. And, and very importantly, how do we help with, with efficiency? Um, how do we get better visibility? Um, how do we get connected to these individuals in real time? How can we look at dashboards to see what's working and what's not? And very importantly for a lot of organizations, how do we integrate what we're doing with the software and systems that they may already have? And I'm gonna go and do a use case about where we're doing that. And then of course, uh, with independence, which is our, of course, our most important goal, which is helping these individuals to be able to, to, to live at home, be able to go to work, um, be able to go to school and do these things in a way where they don't always need to have a job coach or someone in the room with them. So I'm going to talk about uh, basically two use cases today to give you an example of what we're doing. One is uh, Northeast Arc, one of the largest um, uh, uh, HSOs up in the uh, Massachusetts area and Kencrest, uh, which is in Pennsylvania. So in our work with Northeast Arc, uh, it all started with Massachusetts coming out recently and saying, hey, 
Um, we'd like to test the, the, uh, the ability for organizations to support people on a remote basis. So um, they're doing a test this year. And a big part of that is how to reduce wait list and how to help service orgs overcome the labor issues, which, which many of you are, are facing. So the, the key question we're trying to help an organization like Northeast Arc answer is, does providing support remotely to clients let us increase our job co coaching capacity and deliver quality support? Can we do things remotely? Okay. So what we found is, is the old way that they were doing things in a job sustainment program, for example, is they were visiting the individual once a week, they were filling out forms, they were driving to the site, um, et cetera. And what we're, what we're testing right now with, with, with Northeast Arc is, is a way for that coach to be connected to that individual in real time, again, via their phones, through status alerts, through surveys, uh, through video calling, all features that we have within our platform where we can actually track how much video call and texting time is spent, uh, and through automated reminders. Can we digitize uh, that relationship? And can we also help them, uh, in many ways, help them remove a lot of the documentation challenges uh, that they have? So we've gone from filling out uh, forms in Microsoft Word that then have to be transcribed into a billing system to um, to staff being able to use what we call smart forms and then being able to integrate that data into, into billing systems. And we're trying to answer a series of questions here that at, at a kind of a micro level, uh, such as how much drive time was saved by job coaches in the last month by doing some of their support uh, remotely? How is client Adam doing today on an average day? How often did Adam use Life Sherpa for routines? Is he working more independently? And then all those impressions and how we take that data and feed it back in the system so we can see what a report card looks like. Um, in the last quarter, what are the attitude, absenteeism, and achievement trends for these six clients? So again, this is, this is somewhat down in the weeds, but these are, as we got into working with many of the organizations that you all represent, these were the kinds of questions that we were getting and they were asking us to help them answer. Um, how much time has Sally spent this this week remotely coaching or caseload of eight clients. By the way, some of the early data on this was fascinating because what they found is some clients were taking three to four X the amount of time that they thought they were investing and other clients were taking three to four X less time that they were investing. And what are the, you know, what are the differences between those types of clients and, and how do we support them uh, more effectively? And then how does client interaction and overall time spent providing remote support compare providing direct support on a weekly basis. So this is the big question about whether we can do more with remote uh, to replace having to drive out to sites. Do we do that for all clients? Do we that, do that for some clients? How does that work? And what are the data to back that up? So what we're, we're positioning Northeast Arc and we're, we're working in a number of other organizations is to do is to answer a couple of key questions with, with digital technology, which is, can we serve more clients? Can we provide support whenever needed? Can we ease demand for the in-person assistance? And most importantly, can we encourage uh, independence? So that's, that's a big part of what we're doing. Um, I'm gonna talk next about a, a program that we're doing with KenCrest. Most of you are probably familiar with Pro, uh, Project Search program. Uh, this is at a, a hospital up in the Philadelphia area where we're looking to provide a very, very uh, customized remote support solution. And one of the key things that we learned early on in our journey is that um, many organizations have their own content and processes. So how do we build those into the platform? Uh, and then more importantly, every individual had a different set of needs. Uh, and can we address that? So what we're building is a way to scale the ability to customize a solution down to the individual level. One of, uh, just an example, one of our college programs uh, where we're working to, uh, to, in some cases, we, we have a routine that gets 20 kids up in the morning. And we started with one standard routine, which includes, you know, getting up, taking your meds, blah, 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 blah. We have now 19 different versions of that same routine because we allow the uh, uh, the administrators allow the kids to go in and move 
steps around or add steps that are specific to them. And that has been very effective uh, in helping them um, overcome the challenges. And in fact, in that one program, we no longer have an RA knocking on doors. They're doing uh, everything through the app. Um, for our program in uh, Philadelphia with Project Search, um, we created a very custom program and I'm gonna use one young lady as an example. And if you'll see here right in the middle, you'll see that picture of a hallway, okay, with an arrow in it. This was to give her specific directions on how her job was to take the, the blood from one lab to another lab, okay? And she had to walk through the hospital to do that. So we actually built a routine for her that took her step by step through the causeways uh, to get her to the right place. And then we also added in uh, task lists and resources and checklists, and then provided her with a, a way to easily text and video call her coach if she needed assistance. So, and, and this is, her name is Lily, okay? And there's actually a, a story up on, on Facebook about this. Um, big challenge she had is she often got lost transporting uh, the, the blood work to the lab. And in order to find her way, she would stop people or she would uh, call her coach. And there was a lot of friction in making that done. And secondly, when she got to the lab, she wasn't always real clear on what her, what her role was and all the things that she needed to do. So what we built for her was a way that she could see her route, like I showed you on the previous slide, uh, and by the way, the, the great news and one of, this, one of the reasons why this is up on Facebook is she no longer needs to use our technology to get around the hospital. She has generalized it through the pictures and the steps she's been able and where she can just get to the lab now with no help. Um, she uses the checklist that we built in once she gets to the lab to go through all the things that she needs to do. And most importantly, she's made friends at the lab and she's been able to double her confidence level. Um, and and <clears throat> the big part of this is, is a very customized uh, uh, approach to the tools and the activities that she needs to be able to go through. And, and what we do with that is we include self-check and self-audit, and then we're collecting data on the back end to be able to track all those things. So, and, and by the way, I'm more than happy to give anybody a very personalized demo there's a lot to the technology, so I'm just giving you an, over day, an overview today, but if you'd like to see it uh, in action to your particular needs, I'm, I'm more than happy to set that up. So in a nutshell, what we're doing for Project Search in that case is giving them expanding capacity, driving greater client independence, and, and, and hopefully, as we've seen early with Lily, a higher degree of, of, of job success. So Again, we are a full enterprise platform. Uh, think of salesforce.com or any other large uh, CRM or, or, or enterprise platform. There's an app for the client. There's an app for the coach. You can have multiple coaches to clients. You build all this on an administrative desktop. There's a library and training, uh, a, a training portal and an analytics console. And our goal for HSOs is how we can spread out um, and help in job coaching, how to, and in pre-employment, employment sustainment, and residential. By the way, we're working on a program right now where the initial usage of the platform is just going to be for staff. It's just going to be making it easy for staff to be able to collect data as they're in the residential houses. And then once that works, then we'll actually roll it out to individuals um, in those residential compounds that can actually utilize a phone. So what we're trying to do for HSOs is make the shift from staffing shortages to virtual coaching, from support limitations to expanded support, from a lack of visibility to 360 assessments and analytics, and very importantly, lessen the dependency on job coaches so they can, they can manage uh, themselves. So that's on the books that I did want to touch on that we are um, doing residential. Uh, we're actually working with our friends from Simply Home. We're going to be presenting uh, next, but um, one of the places that we're, we're using uh, this right now is with a pilot program with Best Buddies, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And we're, we're using this in a way with a pretty high functioning group um, where they're in an apartment setting and then there's one coach, but she's using it to check in and for them to check in with her. It's a pretty lightweight touch and it's different by each of the clients, depending on what their needs are. But the whole idea is how to help them become 
uh, more self-reliant in that particular setting. So that's all I got. I appreciate you having me today. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, and we can take some questions for Doug if you have them. I had one question that come up um, came up that I didn't think of before, Doug. Uh, when they're using the app on their phone um, and they're in the hospital setting, do they need Wi-Fi to be able to access the different support? Because I know that's a challenge in some of the employment settings. They, they, it's going to depend. The uh, generally, the answer would be yes. You would want to be connected to the cloud. These are all cloud-based systems, um, and. In this particular hospital, we haven't had that issue because they're either logging into Wi-Fi. We do recommend that anybody using the platform also have a data plan on, on the phone. And that's generally backed up. Uh, you know, that's been helpful to get us over any of those, uh, those issues. And Marlene's asking in the chat if you could post your contact information in the chat. Be happy to. Any other questions for Doug? I highly recommend you setting up a demo. It's, it's a really cool product. I have a, a quick question since we do have some um, people from VR here. Yep. Um, what is VR's stance and maybe Doug, you, you know in general uh, about billing and for a time spent job coaching with the, through the app? What we're, what we're learning, and again, we're, we're, we're new into this in the last nine months is that with Massachusetts, for example, they're paying the same rate for remote as they are for in-person. Okay. Yep. Lauren, Lauren and Kim, I don't know if you're still on here. I can't, my screen isn't showing everybody at the same time. Maybe they left. No, I'm, I'm here, I'm okay. sorry. Bye. I'm, <laughs> hi, I'm sorry. It, it takes me, you know, I don't use Zoom as much as, uh, Google and Teams, so it just takes me a minute longer to get my phone and mic and my camera and my mic un undone, and here I am again. Um, VR does have set rates here in Florida for certain um, services, um, all available on rehabworks.org and Sunshine Law Public Knowledge, there it all is. They also have, um, Certain agencies have a, a contract or a grant, if you will, from VR for a specific type of program. And if that is the case, then that's negotiated as a part of that pilot, usually they're pilot projects, as a part of that pilot project, and maybe a combination of services, et cetera. Um, and then they're negotiated as a part of that project, and thus, thus that list is not relevant, it's what's negotiated it as a part of that pilot in that contract. Is that making sense? I'm kind of blah, 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 answering the question on the fly, but um, is that making Some, sense? Someone, yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Lauren, are you saying that a lot of providers are using or accessing remote services in their daily job coaching? Have you heard from providers in Palm Beach County? Some are in some processes of it. It also, um, basically our services are individualized. It depends on the individual. Um, the virtual model is not as effective for some of, or for, for we're finding for our supported employment folks that need that hand over hand type assistance. Um, and again, sometimes if there happens to be a, a parent, advocate, family member, et cetera, who can help perhaps the technology then could be a little more effective, but otherwise we're finding that it's not quite as effective. Um, depends on the disability. Also for some though, on a positive note, um, transportation wise, it helps. Um, for others who do not want to disclose to their employer um, that we have those folks as well, and that's their, their prerogative. And if they're not disclosing and meeting before or after work anyway, virtual actually is much more um, convenient and at just as effective for them if they're needing the emotional support as opposed to the hand over hand. So it really depends on, on the individual as far as, um, it also depends on the type of job. If the person's working virtually, the job coach can be involved virtually. Um, it, it really is individualized. Are there providers in the room that are using remote 
support with some of their clients. I saw Keith, I saw your picture. I know you're across a number of different counties. I was wondering if you guys had talked about it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, as far as like remote job coaching, that is, I mean, I think maybe phone calls and talking to sort over the regular phone is probably what's been happening. We do a lot of other remote classes and such like that. Um, I mean, I definitely see value in this, you know, Doug, I'll, I'll reach out to you and um, get more information about it. Um, you know, VR isn't a, a hourly build program, at least not all the services, most of them are benchmark. So um, VD is a little different. They don't, they're an hourly build program. And last time I checked, they weren't allowing for any type of virtual billing, but, um, but it, for the VR model, it might work out actually pretty well. Yeah, one of the things we learned early on with some of the agencies we were working on is uh, uh, they didn't want uh, to share personal information in terms of phone numbers and, and other data. So that's why we built in our own video calling and texting into the platform so it's all anonymized and the, so you could also track it. So all that, all that remote interaction is done through, through a third party. And I, I would guess you don't, you don't have to have like FaceTime in order to be able to do the video. No, we, we, right. we built our own FaceTime. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, that's definitely got, um, that definitely yep. seems like it would be helpful. Yep. Carrie, thank you for, for having me. And again, I'll post my uh, email address into the chat. And if anyone is interested in, in drilling down more, just respond to the email and we'll set up a time. Wonderful. Thank you for coming, Doug. We really appreciated your presentation. Great, great stuff you're doing. Thank you. All right. Next up, Emily Dancy Grosso. She's here from Simply Home. Um, so we're going to transition the conversation from employment to a little more residential, and she'll talk to us about what um, her company does throughout the United States and then um, specifically Florida as well. Emily? Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen now. I can't see you, so I'm guessing that you can see it. Looks great, thank you. All right, um, so as Carrie said, I'm Emily Dansu Grasso and I'm the Marketing and Sales Coordinator with Simply Home. And I'm very happy to be um, presenting to Florida Group today and seeing some familiar faces because I am from Florida and I've worked in Florida in um, direct service and in program development. I also have a sister with a disability, so I'm really excited to share this information with you all and kind of echoing the conversation that we just had in terms of looking on a state level and seeing different opportunities there is to look to utilizing some of these technology solutions and provide remote support. So we are based in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, however, we work throughout the US. And something that I really appreciate about the Ray family who started Simply Home is that their background is in long-term care services. So really it was for their own organization where they started to look at what was the role that technology could play to support people that were looking to transition at the time from more of an institutional setting into the community. And so they started creating a lot of these technologies uh, first for their own organization and then seeing the needs of providers and families and self-advocates started Simply Home. So we can't really talk about technology uh, without talking about dignity of risk. And so of course, um, you know, thinking about the families that you support and even the self-advocates, there can be some trepidation around utilizing technology as a natural support. Um, but technology really does allow for that opportunity uh, to gain skills and to learn through potential successes and failures with that support net in place so that if assistance is needed, it can be accessed in real time. Um, when we talk with providers, and we mainly do work with provider agencies looking to use technology maybe across uh, the residential programs, um, but as I noted earlier, we do also work directly with families and self-advocates. Um, but what we tell families and anybody looking to start to use technology more in their programs it's just like you prepare for if staff doesn't show up, you have to have a technology plan in place and policies and procedures around the technology, whether you're using Life Sherpa on the job or you're looking to use some of our technology in a residential setting. 
So we use this term enabling technology. And that's something kind of to go back to the conversation that we were having about um, you know, looking for funding opportunities. Oftentimes we are working with states like for example, Pennsylvania who just updated some of their waiver language to broaden the definition from the traditional assistive technology to enabling technology and to some of these solutions that might fall out of that traditional um, definition, but can really empower a person to live with greater independence and to access their community and have opportunity in the workplace. So this term enabling is intentionally broad and it encompasses off the shelf technology and customized technology that can empower independence embody self-determination and enhance quality of life. And so what you'll see on my screen are different pieces of technology. You can see um, some that you might be familiar with and actually have in your home. And then um, the Simply Home sensor-based system, which may not be as familiar to you. One thing that I'll note about some of the technology solutions like the Amazon Alexa or the smart thermostat is that something at Simply Home that we can also do is take some of those off the shelf solutions and integrate it within our larger sensor based system or, you know, ensure that that uh, that smart home technology is accessible by a person with a disability. So things like a smart thermostat or a smart door lock. You know, if a person doesn't have a certain degree of dexterity or is a non reader, they may not be able to use that technology. And so we can customize an interface either on someone's tablet or on their smartphone um, in order that if they need picture based icons or need to be able to use their fist uh, to manipulate um, the different technology, they can do so. But the main technology that we're talking about here is our sensor based system. And the sensor-based system works in three ways. So it's passively monitoring activity. Um, so things like door, window sensors, bed sensors, they're you know, gathering information and detecting activity. However, as a provider or as a caregiver, you might not need to get a notification every single time the front door of somebody's apartment is open in, in a com community supported living setting. Um, really, it's going to be maybe in that second step where maybe you need to get a notification if the door is open during the night hours um, or if the window is open and remains open. So the, the magic happens or really where the customization happens is in that second step. And the way that we can program our technology is in three ways. We can alert the person or excuse me, we can prompt the individual. We can prompt the person through a speaker announcement in their home, through a text, an email, or a phone call. So an example of that would be using a stove sensor with a motion sensor. So maybe that individual turns on their stove and they get distracted by the TV. So we can prompt them through a speaker announcement in their home, John, turn off your stove. The second part is being able to alert uh, staff or natural support through a text, an email, or a phone call. So say that that door opens between the night hours, we can alert a staff person through a text, email, or phone call. And with the alerts, you're able to set it up in a way so that um, say that responder, that, uh, that, that remote support person is unable to acknowledge that alert. They can escalate that to a backup responder um, or if they don't acknowledge that alert within a certain amount of time, it can get escalated to that backup responder to ensure that that person does get support in a timely manner. Um, and then that third part is being able to control something in the environment. So that would be, say, if there's a concern about somebody getting out of bed at night and falling on their way to the bathroom, maybe we would pair a bed sensor with smart lights, lighting someone's path once they go to the bathroom, once they're back in bed, turning those lights off. And then the third part, um, and as Doug said, and what's really powerful about utilizing technology is being able to look at some of those behavior trends and to run reports um, based on the information from the sensors. And also in terms of um, as a provider, if you're using this with your staff to see, you know, when is that staff person acknowledging that alert or how many times is an alert maybe needing to be escalated to a backup responder. 
And I can just speak from my own experience in terms of direct support. You know, oftentimes it's really easy for us to get some of that qualitative data, but to get that quantitative information. So thinking about things like a medication dispenser where you can uh, set a goal for somebody, maybe you're looking for that individual to take their medication 80% of the time without needing to be prompted. And then you look at the report and you see that they're actually taking their medication 95% of the time without needing to be prompted or reminding. So maybe we're over supporting them with technology and they just need um, you know, a reminder on their phone. Um, so the data can be really, really powerful in terms of knowing, um, you know, making informed decisions about somebody's care. So what I'm going to do now, uh, before I kind of walk you through our virtual apartment and talk more about the different technology that we offer, is share a video of a young man named David. Um, David uh, participated in a post-secondary program up here in North Carolina. And he always had the goal of moving out of his family's home. Um, his long-term goal was to build his own log cabin and to live on his uh, family's property and to work at, um, as an EMT and to have a pickup truck. And at first, his, his transition was moving into his own apartment. But I will say that in this last year, he was able to build his log cabin and the technology was able to transition with him. So another thing to note about the technology is that it can be used as a transition tool. And you know, maybe somebody starts using a medication dispenser while living at their family's home with the goal of moving um, into their own uh, in apartment or living more independently in the community. So we'll see if it plays from here or I have to change screens. Hi. Where we started with this journey was when he was a baby. Um, we just never took no for an answer. We had a pediatrician who told us that the only person who would limit David is us. And so we decided when he was two weeks old that we would not limit him in his destiny. Petrol lepings. All petrol lepings. Mm -hmm. On paper, it looks like he has a lot of limitation. But in reality, he's able to do everything that he puts his mind to. It's just a little bit differently. When he graduated, of course, the expectation was that he would have his own place. And I was scared. I didn't know how we would, were going to make that work. And I was the obstacle because I didn't know how he could do it without a roommate. And I didn't know how it was going to work. Actually, the coordinator for his program at Western, she started helping us advocate with his care coordinator with Smoky Mountain Mental Health mm -hmm. to get a system for him so he would not need a full-time live-in. Mm -hmm. And it's worked beautifully. There's sensors all over this apartment. And if a door opens, um, it'll let me know that a door opens when I'm not expecting a door to open. And it respects his privacy it allows me that peace of mind to know that he is moving around and everything's well. David, close and lock your front door. The verbal prompting just basically, what we did was um, we looked at the different areas in his routine that he needed to be prompted on. And we modeled the routine, his kind of his, his daily schedule around the prompting. I said, David, let's out. <laughs> See, Papa on. Yeah. <laughs> David, wake up. David, fix my breakfast. The other piece is that I can track him through the computer, through the routine, whether I know it's prompting him or not. So if I get the wheelies in the morning, like, has he started his breakfast yet? I can log in without having to aggravate him and annoy him with phone calls. He has created a lot of his own destiny by his willingness to take risk and my willingness to allow him to take risk. He um, networked and got his own job um, 
in over in Graham County at the EMS base. Um, and the people love him and he do, does a great job. And I think about how if, if I had been there, they're hovering, worrying about, oh, is he gonna do it properly? Is he gonna make a mistake? Um, is he going, are the people going to accept him? He would still sit, be sitting at home every day. Or he'd be sitting, you know, in a place where he's not satisfied. And so I think it's so vitally important that those of us who do not live in the disability world give our um, fellow human beings who just happen to have a disability the option to make their own choice and for us to support that. Um, when we don't support it, then we are creating a destiny for them that they don't want, and that's not fair. Whoop. Okay, so now I'm going to hop on over and show you uh, take you through our virtual apartment. Uh, we do have a demo apartment in Asheville, but of course we don't have as many in-person visitors. Uh, we did put together about a 20 minute video walking through our demo apartment. So if you are more of a visual learner and you kind of want to see the pieces of technology, I recommend checking out this link. Um, but what you'll notice on my screen is that there's two different Wi-Fi symbols, that blue and the red. So the blue is showing you the sensor-based system. And then the red are some standalone technologies that in themselves might support a person, or maybe that's just what the person needs uh, to have greater independence, or they can be further integrated within the larger system. Um, one thing that I'll note too, that's really important, uh, especially as we look to use technology to support individuals, is that we really take that outcomes-driven approach as opposed to a device-driven approach. So, you know, when we think about smart home technology or we think about technology in general, our minds might go to the latest and greatest or flashy products, but that's really not the best approach in terms of the technology is always changing. Um, and also uh, one piece of technology can be applied in infinite amount of ways specific to that individual's needs. So when we talk with providers, we're always encouraging them to really look at those outcomes that we're looking to achieve and then kind of build that system of support around the individual. Um, and just to know in terms of how fast technology is changing, as you saw in that video with David, uh, he had a white box that was called our Butler, our, our older sensor-based system, and that was about 25 pounds. And our newest system, the Firefly, it's less than a pound. Um, so it's just kind of incredible when you when you think about that and just, you know, the, the, the beauty of that advancement as well is that technology is becoming more affordable and accessible um, as well. So this is our sensor-based system, and this is what we call the Firefly. And this is what the various sensors kind of communicate back to. And then based on how that technology is programmed, we'll determine what happens next. Once again, three things can happen. We can prompt the person, or we can alert staff or natural support, or we can control something in the home environment. So different sensors that we might use with our sensor-based system would be a door or a window sensor. We can also use these sensors on a refrigerator or on a food pantry or on a medication cabinet. And the sensors are going to let you know if something does or does not happen when you would expect it to. Um, so an example would be using a sensor on a refrigerator. And maybe you set a rule that um, if food is not accessed by 9 a.m., alert staff that food has not been accessed, letting you know that maybe that person isn't up and moving around when you expect them to do so. Um, or we would see using these sensors on doors or windows. Uh, sometimes in certain states uh, where the, the provider has the opportunity to maybe fade out, you know, overnight awake support, uh, they might have their support person in a central location, uh, you know, with different houses, and um, utilizing the sensors so that if the door opens during the night hours, send that, that alert to staff that the door is open so they can follow up and provide support and also prompt that person, you know, John, it's time to go back to bed and kind of redirect them at that time. 
And as Doug talked about, which is really exciting, you know, looking at our system and our sensors and being able to utilize the sensors to maybe prompt a routine through the Life Sherpa app. Um, so I'll give an example when we talk about the stove sensor, but even thinking of maybe using the sensor on a bathroom door and at certain times when the bathroom door is open, prompt that person to use their Life Sherpa app to walk them through their different um, tasks, whether that's brushing their teeth as Doug shared with his son or other you know, daily hygiene routines. So there's many different ways that these technologies can really work together in a comprehensive way to provide support and empower that independence. This would be a bed or a chair sensor. Um, when I talk about this sensor, I like to note that one sensor can be used differently based on the time of day. Um, so David uses a bed sensor and the way that it works for him is when he gets into bed at night, he gets a prompt on his speaker announcement reminding him to put on his CPAP machine. The same sensor works differently um, in the morning. So if he's not up by 9 a.m. and he keeps hitting that snooze button, uh, he'll get a prompt reminding him it's time to get out of bed. If he still doesn't get out of bed, then it will alert staff that he's not out of bed and they can um, follow up in person and help him to get ready for transportation. Once again, I can't see your faces, but it's funny. Whenever I talk about this particular sensor, a lot of times providers will ask me if they can use this with their staff um, and making sure that staff is up in and ready for work as well. Uh, we also have a bed shaker. So that would be for somebody that's maybe hard of hearing and couldn't hear that audible prompt, um, but could get that prompt through a, a brief um, you know, vibration. So uh, we'll get questions about like a fire alarm detector or carbon monoxide detector. And although we don't have those products, we do have sensors that you can use with a fire alarm sensor or carbon monoxide detector so that if that event does occur, you can get that information in real time. You know, thinking of individuals that maybe are transitioning to living in an apartment, maybe there's two roommates and somebody burns the pizza and it's not to the next day that the provider gets that information that the fire department was called and all this excitement happened. And so using sensors, you can make sure that when these events occur, you can get that information in real time. Or once again, thinking of somebody that might be hard of hearing, pairing a fire alarm sensor with a strobe light so that if that event occurs, trigger that strobe light helping that person to safely exit their home. In a bathroom, we have a water sensor. Um, so with a water sensor, that's going to be able to detect if there's moisture or water on the floor. So even thinking about somebody that needs 24 hour in-person care, maybe someone that has some physical challenges, the difference of having that staff person sitting on the toilet, you know, making sure that they exit the shower safely or being in a different area of the home. And if assistance is truly needed, could get that notification and then pro provide support to that person. And then a stove sensor. Um, so with our stove sensor, uh, oftentimes we will pair this with a motion sensor. So for somebody that is able to cook independently and we're working on that skill, you know, it's not a problem if they turn on the stove, it's just a problem if they turn on the stove and get distracted and walk away from the stove. So we can pair sensors together to support a specific outcome. And that is a pretty common use case of using a stove sense and sensor with a motion sensor. And as I shared, um, and you know, I know with Doug on the call, just talking about the idea of really supporting that person with everyday independent living skills. So maybe they turn on their stove and that triggers a prompt for them to use their Life Sherpa app and walks them through those different um, steps in preparing a meal. And then once that stove is off, it's verifying that that activity has been completed. So there's many different ways that the technology really can be applied to support independent living. So those are some of our main sensors. Um, and, you know, when we are working with providers and equipping with them with the technology in order that they can provide remote support, um, if possible, you know, within the state, or just knowing that all organizations are faced by such a staffing crisis that this really does allow an organization to effectively and efficiently provide that quality support both um, remotely and in person, you know, we see the need of a provider to be able to uh, drop in and to check in on the person remotely. Um, and because with our company and there are other technology and remote support vendors that offer like 
cameras and kind of more of a security system, we really want to respect that person's privacy in their home. So we're not talking about cameras. However, seeing the need to be able to provide that remote caregiver drop in, um, you can do that through things like an Amazon Alexa or an Amazon show. Um, or a device like the Sines, and this is by a company called Nucleus Care. And some things that are nice about this program, especially if you are a provider, and not only are you providing residential, but maybe you have a day program um, or supported employment, is that uh, this two-way audio and video tablet allows you to drop into the device and provide a check-in. Um, but it also allows the individual to call out to their staff. Uh, so you can program large picture-based icons of family and staff, and that person can push that button and connect with their, their, their loved ones and their care team. Um, some nice features about this device as well is that if you do have a day program, maybe you want to deploy a message across your devices um, as it relates to, you know, what lunch do you want today? And the, the individuals can get that message across all the Nestes in the field. And once they select something, then you can get that information reported back to you. Or maybe you're using this tool and each day the individual is identifying how they're feeling, you know, great, so, so not good. And depending on what they select, we'll send that report to you. So maybe they identify that day as not feeling well. So your team can get that notification and then follow up and check in with that person. Um, the other great feature that's new to this device um, is the ability to do group instruction, but the individual can only see their instructor. So I know when my sister's day program went virtual and I was teaching chair yoga, it can get really hard for some of the individuals that we support in terms of having 30 videos. Um, so this is really nice because the individual is only going to see the instructor on their end. So once again, if you're interested in this particular product, um, not only can it be a part of the, the sensor-based system and allow a provider to provide remote support, but it's also a great tool um, in different program areas as well. So just um, another, uh, a few other devices, because I want to be mindful of everybody's time and leave plenty of time for questions. Um, in terms of exterior safety, uh, some of the technology that we offer would be a ring doorbell. Um, so from an organization standpoint, when you start thinking about utilizing technology, uh, smart home technology, it can get kind of hard to manage a, a bunch of different apps and pieces of technology. So another benefit in terms of working with the technology vendors that you can access all of your technology in one place. So we have a backend client portal uh, where you can see you know, the various ring doorbells that you might have in different locations in the community and the status of that technology. But we can also further integrate that within our system. Um, so say for example, there's somebody where there's a concern about wandering or elopement. We might pair a door sensor with a ring doorbell so that if somebody opens that door, you know, alert staff that the door has been open and also turn on that ring doorbell so we know the direction somebody is going and what they're wearing at that time. Um, or, you know, commonly with providers, they might use ring doorbells so that if there's a person at that individual's home, not only can the individual communicate back and forth with whoever's at their house, but that provider also gets that notification and can communicate back and forth. Um, another use case I've seen is for somebody that's hard of hearing. Maybe we pair a ring doorbell with a smart light. And if somebody's at their home, turn that light on three times, letting them know somebody's at their front door. So once again, um, there's an like I like in terms of working backwards. So what does that person need or what can um, help them to be more successful or to live more independently or not need 24 hour in person staff and then building that system around that person because there's so many different ways uh, that each piece of technology can support an individual. And then this is a smart lock. Um, there's two different products that we carry. This is the Yale smart lock. And what you'll see on my screen is that um, not only does it have the key entry, but it has the pin code. And so you can set up to hundreds of different pin codes. So thinking about um, a person that maybe receives in-home support by multiple staff people and knowing that there is a lot of staff turnover, each staff person can have their own unique pin code. So if that person is no longer providing support, you know, instead of having to replace the door lock, you can just delete that code. 
um, or thinking about somebody that's transitioning to living um, on their own, or as someone talked about earlier, working with someone that maybe has some mental health or some challenges and anxiety, you know, being able to use this within their system so that if there's no motion detected in, um, in the house, then lock the front door or be able to remotely lock the front door to give that person peace of mind that their house, their door is locked. This is our medication dispenser. Um, this is one of my favorite products. I use this with my dad. And some of the things that's nice about this device is it's about the size of a dinner plate. So thinking of somebody that might have some memory challenges and with my dad, he was always misplacing his pill box, but this one is pretty hard to misplace. And you can set up to 28 doses of medication in advance and four alarms on the device as to when somebody would be uh, needing to take their medication. And the way that it works is um, when it's time to take the medication, the device itself will have a red blinking light and an alarm letting the person know it's time to take their medication. Um, and then similar to the other technology, you can uh, customize it in different ways. So for my dad, if he doesn't take his medication out of the device within five minutes of the device sounding, then he will get a phone call reminding him to take his medication. If he still doesn't take the medication, then I receive a text message that he hasn't taken the medication from the device and I can follow up with him um, and, and see why he has not access medicine at that time. You might be able to see that it does have that lock feature, but that's really more so to keep the medication organized in the device. So this is for somebody that is medication compliant and just needs that kind of additional prompt and reminders as to when medication um, is needing to be accessed. So this is our responder app, and this can be used on its own, but it can also uh, be a subscription with our sensor-based system. And this is also a tool just to really help with staffing efficient, efficiency and accountability. Um, so unfortunately, it does not replace your kind of clock in and clock out. Um, however, what you can do is you can set a window of time in which somebody would be checking in um, to provide that in-home support. Maybe it's 15 minutes early or 15 minutes late. And if they don't check in on their phone at that time, it can send that notification to a manager or send that um, notification to a backup support person. You can also create a task list. So maybe somebody comes in early in the week to work on meal prep or uh, you know laundry, and so they can uh, check off what has been completed and what tasks still need to be um, finished. And then the other part to this uh, is just kind of one other like layer of accountability would be using a Bluetooth beacon. So this is a location verification beacon. So if that um, in-person staff is checking in, they have to be within six feet of this device, verifying that they are there at that time, providing that support. So I talked about some of the different smart home technology like the smart lock. Uh, we also offer a smart um, or a automatic door opener, smart lights and a smart thermostat. And I'll share a picture on the next slide of kind of what that customized interface or home assistant would look like. So um, lastly, we do have a personal emergency response system. And many of you are familiar with this. This is the PERS. Uh, this would be one product that would get routed to a call center that would determine if emergency assistance is needed um, or if it's not an emergency and maybe that person's care team just be, needs to be notified. Um, so with this device, there is the push button. There's also the wearable lanyard or a wristlet. Um, with our sensor-based system, so outside of the PERS, Another thing that we commonly will do is use large switches or buttons, maybe by the side of a toilet or in the kitchen or the side of a bed that that pushing person can push that button and the alerts can go out to whoever it's uh, set up to receive those alerts. Um, just knowing that when somebody is maybe overwhelmed or doesn't know what to do or can't pick up their phone in that moment, that if they push that button, that those alerts can be sent um, out to whoever needs to receive them to provide that support. So I think I covered some of the main pieces of technology. Um, there, there are solutions even outside of some of the, the ones that I've covered today. But once again, I, there's so much technology that's available. Um, so really kind of working backwards from what are we looking to accomplish here and what would make the difference in terms of giving this individual um, the opportunity to be as independent as possible. 
So just a snapshot, this is what a home assistant would look like. And there are many different ways that we can customize this interface um, to ensure that that person can really have access to some of the smart home technology in their home. So as uh, Doug introduced and has been talking about this idea of remote support or starting to offer remote support services um, and something that's unique to both of our companies is that with our model of remote support, we really want to equip the providers. So we are giving these tools directly to the provider agency in order that you are internally creating these remote support services. Um, both offering that remote support coaching on, in the workplace or offering remote support to somebody in their home. Um, you know, there's different solutions that are available. For example, with some of the other uh, technology vendors, they have a third party monitoring center. So with that model, you're kind of outsourcing to a third party, maybe during the overnight hours. Um, but with our model, we really want to equip the organizations directly in order that you can utilize your own staff um, and, and, and provide not only that in-person care, but also be able to provide that remote support. So just a little bit about our process. And I, I know I'm coming close to time. I'm watching the clock, but the guy said they would not take as much time. So I had the floor a little bit longer. Um, so with our process, we really have two different uh, processes. If we're working with a provider, um, that want and the individual process. So with the provider, um, what we really do is we partner with the provider and provide that education and help them to develop their policies and procedures and create their technology first plan um, to ensure that the technology is, uh, you know, going to be used appropriately and, and to help the organization to see how to identify individuals that can benefit from this solution. Um, but if we're working with a provider or we're working with an individual, we're gonna take everybody through a person-centered process. So even if you are wanting to put technology in five um, community supported apartments, or you want to use technology just with your loved one, we're gonna take everybody through this person-centered assessment um, so that we can really identify what are those goals for that individual? What are their preferences? What are those concerns? We're gonna find out more information about the home environment so we can make the recommendation as to, you know, does this person need a cellular sensor unit or do they have internet and Wi-Fi to access? Um, so it's uh, identifying a person that could benefit from the technology and then um, filling out an intake on our website. Uh, once that intake is completed, we set up a person-centered assessment where we create a system recommendation. So it's a very detailed plan that will talk about, you know, which technology we recommend and how it will support those outcomes. A lot of that information can go directly into somebody's support plan. Um, and then from there, once that's approved, we set up a rules call where we're going to collect the information to program the technology. And then the technology will be sent to location for installation. So just some key points to remember is focusing on outcomes um, and knowing that technology is a moving target and it's, it's uh, doesn't do us any good to kind of get caught up on one piece of technology, but really look at, you know, what are we looking to achieve? And that technology is a natural support. It's a complement to care. You know, as a provider agency, and especially when we start to use technology, there can be some resistance, even from your direct support professionals, or this idea that technology is replacing people. And it's definitely not the case. It's just helping um, organizations to use their resources, uh, you know, more effectively and to use the, 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 the professionals that they have in a more effective way. And then education and communication. Um, another thing in terms of just the provider process, and if I connect with you, 
at another time. One thing is we always direct our uh, providers to look into education around enabling technology. Uh, we make a lot of referrals. It's called SHIFT, S-H-I-F-T, and it's an enabling technology credentialing program where they have opportunities for direct support professionals for agency-wide first technology first training um, and enabling technology uh, specialist training. And that uh, really starting small, you know, sometimes this can get really exciting and we might want to start to use technology in all of the residential programs that we have. But uh, the best place to start is really where your successes are going to be. So maybe it's a medication dispenser. And that means that that person isn't going to have to wait for staff just to come to their house and make sure that they're taking their medication when they are medication compliant. And that medication dispenser is really what they need to have greater independence and um, so forth. So just uh, lastly, I had the opportunity not too long ago to interview a mom of an adult son with autism. And it was just really amazing just to hear her perspective and to kind of hear what the system means for her son. And just knowing that um, she's really setting her son up um, to really feel and to be independent and to utilize his technology and not need to rely on her to give him those reminders and those prompts. So this is um, a QR code that will take you to our website. The first part is just to contact us and to get in touch um, and identify as being new to Simply Home and if you're an uh, individual or family or a provider. And then we will uh, kind of talk about next steps. I will um, share my email. We are also working with Carrie to have the opportunity in the state of Florida to really connect um, to families and providers. And also as discussed on that last question, looking at funding opportunities and ways that we can work with the state to ensure that this technology can be funded through the waiver, um, knowing that you know, it may not be uh, traditional in terms of assistive technology or that that person needs it to, to, to every day you know, have functionality, but at the same time, what it means in terms of choice and people living as independently as possible and to support providers um, with the crisis that we are all in, in terms of not having um, you know, enough staff to support as many people that need services. Thanks, Emily. I see um, Nicole commented um, that she loved the video. And Marlene asked, um, can the product be purchased individually? What what product is that, Marlene? I'll reach out to you, Emily, because it's it's a personal question. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was the one with the uh, the one that it that the person would only have an, see the instructor directly, like if you were doing the yoga class because that would be really um, helpful. So I'll reach out to you separately. Definitely. Yes, and with our, um, that would be one product that you're talking about that I would, I'll, I'll direct you, I'll put you in good hands uh, with our, our partners at Nucleus Care. With the other products, we do, you know, take everybody through that assessment process. So even if you have a client in mind that maybe just needs that medication dispenser, just because we want to ensure that it is a good fit for that person, we're gonna take everybody through that uh, person-centered assessment. Any other questions for Emily? I have one question. Go ahead, um, Hi, Emily. Hi. Um, with, your, with your pill um, dispenser, is it like just for one pill or does it um, like, is it, do it rotate per day or how does that, or do they have to get it out themselves? Is it just a reminder? Yes, that's a great question. So the device, you can um, fill up to 28 doses of medication in advance and up to four alarms when somebody needs to take their medication. So with my dad, he takes medication twice a day. So that means that that device, you know, is good for him um, for uh, two weeks. And so what happens when it's time to take the medication, the device itself will have that alarm and blinking sound and that single dose will be available. Okay. Um, and then the device will rotate when that, that second alarm sounds and that PM dose will be available. So you okay. can pre-fill, um, you can also get additional trays. So for somebody that maybe has a, a nurse that you know, fills their medication or a pharmacy, you can have them pre-fill 
um, those trays. Okay, thank you. And I'll, I'll also just uh, emphasize again, in terms of some of the work we've been doing in the state of Florida and really looking to um, see what funding is available and you know where can people get these solutions if they are looking to have that, um, wanting to live more independently in their community. And we have uh, presented with FAST and, and kind of shared our resources. And we've also talked with the, um, BSIP, the Brain Spinal Cord Injury Program. And we are in the process of trying to become a vendor with them um, because there is uh, some funding av available through them for this type of technology. And as uh, we saw with our first presenter, you know, some of the things like the medication dispenser or the PERS or things that might fall under more of a traditional definition or durable medical equipment may be covered. Um, but sometimes when we work with providers, they may be directly purchasing the technology and then indirectly, you know, getting that re reimbursement on the back end. So there's, there's ways uh, to access it, but we're always looking for more opportunities just to ensure um, that the technology can be covered. Um, but the other thing to note too, from a provider perspective with the, both of the solutions that we've talked about today, if the alternative is 24 hour in-person support, the return on investment and the cost savings um, is significant in terms of being able to decrease the need for 24 hour in person support by using technology in complement to care. That's a great point. I don't see any further questions in the chat. We hope you all enjoyed our technology focused presentations today. Um, we are looking potentially to continue our um, topic of housing uh, for next SNAC meeting. We're going to, um, we've been asked to focus on family created housing solutions. Um, so we're gonna look at families that have created housing solutions for their adult children. And, and we'll hopefully have uh, more information soon about that uh, meeting coming up. If anybody has any ideas for um, topics, you know, that you would like to see as part of the SNAC meeting, uh, you have my information. Um, you can certainly uh, send us, you know, what your ideas are. Um, and thank you all for um, speakers for providing this information and thank you all for attending. And we will see you all in May. All right, thank you. Thanks. Take thank care. you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.